So yeah, we're talking about roadmaps. Um, I think I'll start with introducing myself a little bit. Um, not very common, but it is common where I come from. Um, so a little background about me. Um, I basically spent a decade of leading R&D divisions, specifically in data science, even more specifically normally in cybersecurity domain. Um, I started my career in the uh, Israeli military. I'm originally from Israel, and I'm now living in Australia. Um, I'm very passionate about mentoring people, and I have mentored scientists and engineers and analysts, and I've done all of these. I started with um, C development, and I went up to Python. Um, and I would say that my expertise is in actually deploying code. I think that I'm very good at research, but I'm even better at bringing it to production, and that's what I'm going to share with you today. Um, I have a master's in computer science. I really like hiking. This is me hiking in Western Australia, and I really love cats. Um, so that's a little bit about me. Um, so what are we going to talk about today? I shared with you that my experience is leading R&D organizations, and I'm going to share with you the framework that I converge to in leading research that is actually delivered to production. It's a whole two different things on writing Python code that you can tr translate into a paper, and it's a different thing to bring it to production and actually serve it to customers. And the whole way that I designed this framework is to enable a promise. You can actually promise to deliver something that is based on research and also give a time frame, which is something very rare, right? Like how can you promise when are you going to finish the research? Um, so today's agenda, um, we're going to start with a big list of ideas. Ideas of things you can do, models you can build, and then we're going to extend that list. Um, we're going to try and create a score for every uh, task, how feasible it is, how you can actually bring it to production, and then you're going to create a prioritized list. And after you have a prioritized list, we're going to talk about how do we actually do research in a contained, agile way. Um, we're going to talk about agile rituals, what are the time frames, and you're going to end up with a really good plan on how you're going to conduct research that would actually be code that goes to production. Why is my slides off? <laughs> okay. Um, so what does a business need? Let's say you are the first data scientist, the first machine learning engineer in the company, or you're the machine, learner, machine learning team lead, or even the CTO. And you want to build something that you know is based on an AI, it kind of needs research, but at, at the end of the day, you're building it for a business. Um, so let's break it down. Your first step as a machine learning leader, and again, you can be the engineer, you can be the CTO, is to understand what is the vision for the company, what is the vision for the product, and to try and understand how you can transform it into components. Now, each component I would call a single model task, and this is really important because this is going to be the smallest unit that I'm going to talk about. Um, so imagine you're going to have a single model task that is actually translated into business and product, and let's talk about it a bit more. Um, so here I'm going to give an exercise. I've, I've written it down uh, below. Imagine you're working for a digital health company, and they have a lot of data of electronic um, medical records, and they have thousands of patients, thousands of data points, and essentially they want to build something that would give value. But the question is, value to who? Who is the company selling the product to? Or who um, is the end customer? So if you were to ask me, and here I give it at the top, I am the machine learning leader, if I had that type of data, my idea would be to deliver some kind of diagnostic model. I think that would be the most helpful to people. I can take the data, I can understand what is the normal diagnostic for every case and kind of learn the model um, of diagnostics. But is that necessarily the best for the business? Okay, not an interactive, okay. Um, <laughs> so for example, I think that this is going to help mankind the most, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to sell the product more because apparently my business is selling to doctors. 
And doctors don't need help with diagnostics, they actually need help with other stuff. For example, if you were to ask um, the CEO, the CEO would say, listen, I talk to a lot of doctors and what they care about the most is actually the operations in the clinic. So they're gonna give an idea. I want you to write a model that would enable me to replace the clinic's operation manager. This is the idea of the CEO. Okay, and then you go to the CTO and you ask him, wait, or them, sorry, maybe her. Um, what do you think would be the best for us to build for the business and to enable the product to our customers? And he got really interested in LLMs, it's the hottest new trend, and he's saying, listen, I think we should learn general practitioner medicine. We're gonna take all the books of general practitioner and we're gonna retrieve and answer questions to help doctors in their work. And this is just a few examples, but basically I think you understand the idea of my first step would be to go to every stakeholder in the company, including myself, but others, and ask them, what do you think we should build? And now here we created a list. Now, obviously not all tasks should be rated the same, but this is the first step of creating your roadmap. And this is an interesting one because now you get to see all of the different viewpoints and it's centered on what you can do, what the business can do, what the data that you have that you can actually achieve this with. And now we're gonna go to the second step. So the second step would be to try and rank all those tasks in a score. So again, I created a kind of list of questions that you need to ask and you don't necessarily know the answers yourself. You will probably need to go and talk to other people in the business to understand most of those answers, but then you can actually rate those tasks. Now, if you think about the task beforehand, and I should have mentioned it in a, in a moment, these all fit the idea of one model task, right? So customer return analysis, this is one model. Or a diagnostic model is one model. So we have a one model task. And now when we're starting to rate them, I created five different scores that I think we can uh, rank each task that will ultimately um, help us in deciding the, the overall score. So for example, model development score, which is normally something that you can answer yourself, is how hard is it to achieve a basic model? How quickly can I write a model that does this pretty quickly? But then the second question is, how quickly can I um, achieve a great model that has amazing performance? Um, or how hard will it be to incorporate this model in the product? It depends on how many of the other components in the product is already ready for it. For example, let's say that I decided to build the diagnostic model. Do we have an interface ready? Is that something that I need to take into account when I'm thinking of if, the, if, if this research something that is worth doing right now? So all of these are um, questions we can answer either together with other stakeholders in a company or yourself. But there is something here that I would like to note specifically um, that I said, uh, I set a different score for model performance measurement. And this is an interesting question and I had a conversation about this earlier with a friend of mine. Um, Sometimes building a model is really easy, but assessing how good it is is really hard. For example, it's really easy to build an LLM and an LLM-based API nowadays, right? But how hard is it to understand if it's actually really good, if it's hallucinating? And then sometimes building the whole system to actually validate that it's correct is so hard that the score would be basically zero. So sometimes when you wanna rate different tasks, you need to make sure that, I set it as a differentiator, and again, this is because I'm very experienced in this. This is two different questions that would make your task look very different in terms of when you wanna put it in the roadmap. So how do you correct, how do you measure success? How do you measure correctness? But there are other questions that you can put it on a scale. For example, you can talk to your product manager and understand the customer over value. So you need to make sure that when you're looking at a task, who is my end customer? What do they want? Am I answering one of their um, pain points or bottlenecks? And time to market, how long will it take to bring it to market? Or what level of accuracy I actually need 
to bring it to market. And this is a very two different things. For example, um, let's talk about autonomous cars. I think it wouldn't be a shock to know that autonomous cars exist, right? And they have an accuracy of, I don't know, 99%. But in terms of regulatory, it's not enough. So people have been working years and years to improve that another 1% to actually bring it to market. And I don't know, I've never driven an autonomous car, maybe you have, and I'm still waiting. Um, so I think the time to market score is really important because if you're able to build a model and you're able to assess its accuracy, but the customers aren't gonna use it if it's not 100% accurate, I wouldn't do that task. Um, so that's another example of a question you should ask yourself and the other stakeholders. And in terms of engineering, um, again, I gave a few examples of questions and you can all take a picture of that slide. Um, but I think one of the interesting questions, and again, this is very relevant to LLMs, is do I have the resources <laughs> to run this model? Because sometimes when you have like a really small company that just started, deploying an LLM-based component isn't that trivial at all <laughs> in terms of money, believe me. Um, so this is another question to ask yourself because if you're going to do that task, and only by the end point you're going to realize, oh my god, I spent so much money on this, I cannot put it in production, that's going to be really sad. Um, so this is another way to plan. So after you answered all these questions, mazel tov, <laughs> you have a weighted score, and you can actually create a prioritized list of all of those tasks that we just started with brainstorming at the beginning. So if we're doing a quick recap so far, we're only halfway through our plan, we started with making a really big plan based from business and based from other stakeholders. We extended it because we had a lot of conversations. And then we assessed all the parameters for each task. And we eventually have a prioritized list. So we're only halfway here because a list isn't a roadmap. It's not a plan, right? A roadmap needs timing and a lot of other stuff. So. Let's talk about the structure of how, how we're actually doing research. So I'm gonna define something that I call a research cycle. Um, and it's carried out by one researcher. And it has six, ste six steps. And we're gonna go over each and every one of them. So the first step is literature review. Now again, I'm talking about stuff that are research-based, right? We're not um, maintaining existing code, we're creating a new model to add to a product. So the first step would be to actually not invent anything <laughs> and read a lot of stuff. It can be academic papers, it can be blogs, it can be GitHub projects, but the idea is that I would tell my researcher, listen, the first step that you need to do is to understand what others have done already. If we go back to the diagnostic model, I'm sure you are all well aware that we are not the first people who thought about creating a di diagnostic model. Um, and we can definitely leverage from other people's research. So I would expect the deliverable of that stage from my researcher to have a summarization and a comparison of the solutions that they covered and to have a selected solution. This is my proposed solution. The next stage would be to actually develop it. Now sometimes it's easy, sometimes you chose a paper or project that has an open GitHub and you can just download it, tweak it to your data, and use it, but sometimes it's a bit more work. And this is the stage that you're actually gathering all the relevant label data that you have in your company, and you're making it fit the model. And I would expect that the deliverable for that stage would be a notebook or a project that is ready to run on data. Um, I would obviously prefer Python. Uh, I heard there's a conversation tomorrow saying that maybe Python shouldn't be your choice. Um, but I would prefer Python, which is why I said a notebook. Um, and then the third step would be to actually conduct an experiment, which is basically to take that code and run it. And I would expect the result of this would be the first empirical results of the model on data that is relevant to our company. And it should be in the given time frame, and I'll talk, touch about it in a moment, but researchers or engineers can do this infinitely, right? You can always try and improve your model and run it again and again, especially when it's running on data. You have ideas of how you can improve the data, how you can improve the model. Nope, we're gonna put a stop to it and we just want results. 
that's the end of this stage. The next stage would be a real world experiment or unsupervised as I call it. And this stage is to incorporate this model in your pipeline. Now in a big company, you might have two different environments, staging and production. So here it would be um, in staging, but if you don't have a staging that maybe, I don't know, do a small cohort of um, clients. And the result of this stage would be empirical results of the model on, on uh, real data. But the most interesting thing about this stage is not improving the metrics. I don't want you to prove to me that you have better performance or accuracy. But in this stage, actually, I would expect my researcher to show me that they understand the real data, they understand the performance of the model on the real data, and they're actually exploring mistakes. So at the end of this stage, I would expect my researcher to tell me about all the possible mistakes my model can make on real world data and kind of upper bound it. Let's talk about worst case scenario. How many customers are gonna be affected by it and what type of mistakes are, are they going to make? Because no model is perfect. We're living in a statistical world. But I wanna know, as someone who's going to deliver this to production, what type of mistakes I'm going to face. Because that's what I'm going to approve as the leader, as the manager, as the one responsible for this code. So this stage is nothing about improving the model and everything about learning how it's working on the real world data. The next stage would be to push it to production. In some companies it's really easy, you just switch it from staging to production. In some companies it's not, so it's worth mentioning it because maybe you need to make some code changes and I don't know, code reviews and so on. But I would expect that at the end of this stage we have the code running in production on real data and actually delivering value to our customers. And the last stage, which is not least important, is monitoring. When you're delivering a model to production um, and you've already done all of this research cycle, you have this amazing analysis of how it's supposed to act, right? This is what we approved. In stage four, we understand how it's supposed to act and what is a super bound or some, the upper bound on mistakes. So we can actually create, I don't know, a dashboard or some kind of mechanism to track it in production and to make sure that it's behaving as expected. So I would expect that the last stage of research cycle is actually to automate this analysis in a way that we can keep track on it in production. So this is a quick recap of the process. But now one of the questions is, and again, I'm coming from a leadership point of view, but it's true if you're leading even yourself. There's a question of how do I support this research cycle? So I know all of us are trained engineers in Python and we're very used to agile. And one of the things that I hate most personally is the daily stand-up. And here I took it from the Atlassian website. Um, they say the daily stand-up is a short daily meeting to discuss the progress and identify blockers. So, in a very um, teasing way, I would ask, are we still doing dailies? Because one of the misalignments I feel for research is that if a researcher is blocked in this research cycle that I just discovered, that I just, just covered for you, it wouldn't be solved by aligning it with more people. <laughs> like their problem isn't alignment. And moreover, if they have a problem it's not something that they're gonna cover in two minutes in the daily and then get answers. It's something that they need to share full context because they're actually stuck in a major question in research. And those types of problems don't, oc don't occur daily. <laughs> I would say maybe they occur like weekly. But as a researcher, sometimes like the difference I have from yesterday to today is that I wrote a really meaningful one line in Python. That's the difference. I would have nothing to talk about in the daily. So I would argue that we need to adjust it a bit. And I'm offering alternative rituals. Um, so the first major one is a research review. Um, and the whole idea here is to give the researcher an option to showcase the work in full context. They can share where they started, what they thought, the literature review, their questions, and they can actually raise questions for debate. Because imagine you have an entire research team you actually care for their ideas. You actually care for their opinions. You just need to give them full context so they can actually give meaningful 
um, ideas. And then you can go back and you fix and redo and you try something else. I don't know, you had a, a different type of model you didn't think or a different type of data augmentation you didn't think about. But the only way that people can actually activate those thoughts is by having full context of what you're doing. So this is the idea of research review. The second ritual is a tech one-on-one, -on -one, which I'm sure all of you are very um, used to. But the way that I see a one-on-one -on -one with one of my researchers is um, a brainstorm together with a senior tech team member that, again, they can share full context and we can actually decide on the next steps. So I'm full aware of their research. The whole idea of the one-on-one -on -one is not to update me on their status, but it's actually for them to share with me questions that they have as if they were in a research review, just in a more intimate setting, um, and especially in a more timely setting. So we can do it once a week or maybe twice a week. It's kind of based on the experience level and the independence level of the researcher. Um, but that would be my one-on-one -on -one with my researchers when it comes to research. Uh, a weekly. So again, I'm deleting the dailies. <laughs> and we do have weeklies where we update each other on where we are on the research cycle timeline. We all agree that this is a timeline that we had, so we can say, oh my god, I just finished my literature review, or I'm now in the unsupervised um, phase. So we all understand where we are at each other's um, research stages. But the interesting thing that can happen in a weekly is something that I call a spotlight, which is um, a team member can ask for a time in the weekly where they're going to share their current problem with the entire team. So it's like a miniature research review, but they get a chance to share full context of a specific issue that they would like to debate with the team in the weekly. Or maybe if they saw something really interesting online, they read a new research, they heard about Google releasing Gemini and they want to share it with the team in full context, that's another option for a spotlight in the weekly. So the weekly essentially is a very short update and then a spotlight for anyone who wants to share something with full context. And the last ritual is the project or scrum meet, which is usually when you align with other stakeholders, I don't know, engineering, product, marketing, uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be the researcher itself. Sometimes it can be just the lead. It kind of depends on how your company is structured. But the whole idea is that you can communicate on where in the research cycle this current research is being uh, done where it is right now, and you can actually communicate on deadlines. And we're going to elaborate in a moment. And I'm going to drink water from it. <laughs> so... Let's incorporate the rituals in the process of a research cycle. As you can see, I'm building it, right? So at the end of the literature review, I would just review the um, deliverable on a tech one-on-one. -on -one. Same as for the developed proposed solution. This is just, running, uh, just writing the code. This is another tech one-on-one. -on -one. But the first event that is research review is after the lab experiment. This is the first time a researcher would actually share their entire research with the entire team. So they can give full context, they can give the model that they chose and why they chose it, and the actual results on data for, that belongs to the company. And this is the first time that people can actually talk and give ideas on the research. After the real world experiment, another research review, but a very different one, because now they need to share how they researched the data, how they understood the mistakes, how they uh, upper bounded the mistakes. This is normally the most interesting research review because this is where you're actually being very creative. So a lot of people have a lot of ideas of, wait, did you check, I don't know, the segment of those customers? Maybe those customers have a different experience and maybe you need to look at those numbers more. Um, so this is another research review. And if everyone agrees, and this is an interesting um, decision here, I would expect that the research review after the real world, I want the entire team to agree that they agree that the performance is good enough for production that makes every one of us reliable for this code. Because think about it this way. Every member of the team is fully aware of the research from start to top because they had full context. And they actually gave ideas and maybe they did another iteration to improve it. So I would expect my entire team to be responsible for the code that we're going to approve. So I would ask my team in that research review after stage four, so do you all agree to push it to production? 
And if someone says no, then we need to understand why. Is there some questions we need to ask? If everyone agrees, we're pushing to production, and then, again, just an update on a one-on-one -on -one to make sure that everything went fine. And lastly, um, the monitor in production, I would normally um, suggest that my researcher would do it in a spotlight to maybe share the dashboard with the entire team. Again, because I want shared responsibility. I want everyone to be able to track it and not just that researcher. So they would usually share it with the team in that form. Now let's talk time frames. So we have stages of research. We have rituals to support that research. Now let's talk time frames. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, a trained researcher will normally strive for perfection. And I'm sure um, you've all had it before. You want to achieve the best model. You want to achieve the be best metrics. Um, but as leaders, I think that our <laughs> responsibility is to balance between thoroughness and fast delivery. We have to put a stop to it. Um, and I put here one of my favorite quotes, which is, done is better than perfect, by Sheryl Sandberg. Um, a perfect model is amazing, but a finished model is even better. Um, so the whole research cycle framework is designed to promise the delivery of value. I'm not promising the best model, I'm promising a model and in a timely manner. And that's really important, especially when you're building stuff that is surrounded by engineering and other people that you need to deliver it with. So once the iteration is done, and you actually delivered something to production, you have KPIs, you know the performance. And then as a leader, you can say, okay, you know what? I think we can maybe do another iteration to improve that model because it's worth it. But then you can at least make a data-driven decision if you want to keep improving this model. Because it's already in production, it's already delivering value, and then you can compare it to other tasks that you have at hand and see if it's actually worth it to try and improving this specific model. Because if not, go to the next task and do something that is going to benefit the, the product more. But perfecting the model isn't necessarily the most valuable thing you can do. But delivering the value is definitely the most valuable thing you can do. So if I'm incorporating time frames, and again, I'm just putting an end. I'm just telling them, listen, this is not perfect, and I see a lot of shocked faces. Um, so here I gave an example. Again, this is just based on my experience. This generally describes a senior researcher timeline. Maybe in a junior uh, researcher, I would uh, expand it a bit. Um, so actually, the, one of the biggest chunks would be the literature review, because I think that most of the things we're doing, a lot of people have done in the past, and that would be a great benefit to how so su successful you're going to be. So I just gave times here. We can discuss it later if you want to elaborate a little bit more. Um, but the idea is that I believe that you can start with an idea and finish it in production in seven weeks. It's not going to be the best model, but it's going to be done. And then you're going to have KPIs, and you're going to have an idea if you want to improve it or not. Um, so seven weeks of one researcher. And if we're circling back to our prioritized list, now we can actually assign open research cycles to our researchers based on their expertise and uh, independence level and take it from our prioritized list. And then magically, you're going to have a list of all the tasks, your tasks that your team is going to do. And you can actually communicate with all of the other stakeholders in the company. When are you going to deliver it? Exactly what are you going to deliver? You can talk with engineering and QA and marketing. Um, because you know you're going to have a model in production in seven weeks. We can talk about the metrics once we have a first model and what we can expect for the next iteration. But you're going to have it in seven weeks in production. And now we actually reach the, the finish. <laughs> You have a roadmap or a plan for your team. You know exactly how we're going to deliver it. Um, and that was me. That's my um, contact. Feel free to, I don't know, reach out and ask any questions. And I hope you found it really helpful. I find it really helpful for me. Um, and thank you so much for listening to me. <laughs>